Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get ready. Um, welcome to this week's <coughs> conference. Um, I'm coming to you via Zoom. I'm Eliza Evans, um, and I'm giving the introduction. We, and I apologize I'm, uh, via Zoom. We had a lot of schedule uh, interruptions this week. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Mark um, Schwartz. Uh, Dr. Schwartz is currently an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology. He received his medical degree at Stony Brook, followed by an internship and residency at the University of Miami, and finally a fellowship in uh, medicine, hematology, and oncology at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, and today, Dr. Schwartz will be talking to us about adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia program at CU Anschutz. With that, uh, welcome Dr. Schwartz and enjoy, well, look forward to your talk. Hey, well, thank you for that introduction and, and thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, so um, I'll start by giving an overview of the field of adult ALL um, and then talk about uh, some of our current approaches um, and uh, some of our outcomes with uh, our current approaches. Um, so just by way of background, um, so ALL is, is thought of as a, a younger person's disease. Uh, the peak incidence occurs in young children uh, between the ages of one and five. Uh, it's a rare disease uh, with uh, only 6,000 uh, new cases per year in the US uh, and about 50% of those cases uh, occurring in uh, patients uh, 18 years of age and older. And in the adult population, uh, roughly 75% uh, of ALL cases are uh, B lineage ALL uh, and roughly 25% are T lineage ALL. Um, and in adults, uh, roughly uh, about a third of all ALL cases are uh, characterized genomically uh, by the uh, translocation 922 or Philadelphia chromosome. Um, so historically, there's been a, a large discrepancy in outcomes between uh, children and adults with ALL. Um, so this is uh, SEER data from the last three decades um, showing that for uh, patients um, 15 years of age and younger, uh, the five-year overall survival is greater than 80%. Um, for patients between 15 and 60 years of age, the five-year survival um, has ranged from between 30 and 60%. Um, and for the oldest age group, patients 60 years of age and above, uh, the five-year survival has been less than 20%. And you know, the historic reasons for uh, the, the uh, relatively poor outcomes seen in adults with, with this disease uh, mainly has to do with um, very high rates of relapse after achieving initial remission um, and very poor survival um, after the uh, time of, re of relapse. So uh, to give an overview of the um, ALL treatment landscape in uh, 2022, um, so starting with the uh, oldest treatment modalities, we have multi-agent chemotherapy and allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, the first major uh, therapeutic advance happened when um, BCR-ABL uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, were first developed for CML, um, but were also uh, found to be uh, quite effective um, in uh, Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL as well. And in the last five to 10 years, we've had uh, really a, a nice influx of uh, newer immunotherapies, um, particularly for B-cell ALL. Um, and those are uh, first plenitumumab, which is a CD19 uh, bispecific T-cell engager. Inotuzumab, which is a CD22-directed antibody drug conjugate. Um, and then, of course, uh, CD19-directed uh, CAR T-cells. So, uh, you know, equally important to uh, some of the recent therapeutic advances in this disease um, has been um, uh, a real evolution in terms of how we uh, risk stratify uh, patients with ALL, um, and specifically the recognition that uh, minimal residual disease, or MRD, uh, has really consistently been shown to be 
Um, the most significant predictor of outcomes in this disease, um, uh, even when uh, accounting for traditional risk factors like cytogenetics. And our uh, methods for uh, assessing MRD um, have also evolved as well um, to the point where uh, now we have a very highly sensitive um, MRD assays that are capable of detecting disease down to a level of around uh, one times 10 to the negative six. Um, and that um, is actually uh, very important. Um, and as we, as we gain more experience with these uh, next generation MRD assays, um, we're finding that even very low levels of detectable disease between um, 10 to the negative four and 10 to the negative six um, are actually uh, quite clinically relevant in terms of being able to predict which patients are uh, more likely to have uh, poor outcomes. So I'd like to now shift gears and talk about some of our uh, current approaches to uh, treating uh, pH positive ALO. So just by way of background, um, in the uh, pre-tyrosine kinase inhibitor era, um, TH positive ALL was associated with a very poor prognosis, um, mainly due to uh, intrinsic uh, resistance to uh, conventional chemotherapy agents. Um, the best outcomes were achieved if patients could achieve a remission um, and then undergo uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, however, even with that approach, uh, the long-term survival is only around 40%. So the first uh, major breakthrough uh, came when um, the first generation TKI imatinib um, was added to induction chemotherapy. Um, and it was shown that um, adding imatinib to chemotherapy uh, improved uh, response rates and improved survival um, versus uh, chemotherapy alone. Um, but even with um, imatinib and later second generation TKIs like asapnib, um, combined with induction chemotherapy, um, we saw that uh, response rates were, were greatly improved. Um, however, in a number of landmark studies, uh, it was shown that um, still the, the best outcomes uh, were achieved if patients um, underwent um, an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Uh, there have been really key, three uh, key observations recently that have uh, really changed the way that we think about managing this disease. Um, the first one is that um, in a, a large retrospective study, it was shown that achievement of a complete molecular remission um, with TKI-based chemotherapy um, predicted favorable long-term outcomes, um, even without uh, stem cell transplant. Um, number two, um, across uh, a number of studies with the satinib-based regimens, which had really become the standard of care, um, it was shown that um, roughly 75% of relapses um, occurred uh, actually uh, uniformly uh, with the uh, T315I um, ABL uh, kinase domain mutation. Um, and then number three, more recently, it's been shown that the, com the combination of a TKI with lenitumumab, which is an immunotherapy drug, um, produces uh, very high rates of complete molecular remission um, and maybe a, a viable alternative uh, to the combination of TKI plus intensive chemotherapy. So thinking about what the um, ideal frontline regimen would look like for these patients, um, based on the, the information I just showed, um, I think it would include, number one, uh, preferential use of panatinib in the frontline setting uh, to mitigate the risk of T315I mediated relapse. Um, number two, early use of lenitumumab with a TKI uh, to achieve rapid molecular remission. And number three, um, allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, for patients who fail to achieve a complete molecular remission with lenitumumab um, or chemotherapy or both. So uh, we um, designed a regimen for, uh, for patients with newly diagnosed pH positive ALL 
um, where um, they initially receive uh, the combination of the satinib and prednisone, uh, which is a, a well-established uh, induction regimen in adults. Um, patients who achieve remission uh, then are switched from the satinib to panatinib. Um, and patients who have uh, persistent MRD in remission um, then can go on to receive uh, two cycles of lenitumumab with panatinib, um, uh, up to two cycles of lenitumumab. Um, and then for patients who then are in a complete molecular remission, um, they can then go on to a moderate intensity uh, chemotherapy consolidation. So, um, you know, prior to when we started implementing that strategy, the uh, major strategy at our center um, had been to um, treat patients with the satinib-based induction um, and then uh, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant um, for all patients who were transplant eligible. Um, so we've uh, began to uh, look at uh, comparing um, these two cohorts uh, with the uh, 2014 to 2020 cohort, um, having uh, primarily uh, received the satinib-based induction followed by stem cell transplant, um, and the more recent cohort um, having uh, received treatment um, as per the strategy that I described on the previous slide. So um, as you can see in the more recent cohort, um, all patients um, were switched from the satinib to panatinib, um, after induction. Um, the majority of patients received uh, either plenitumumab or chemotherapy uh, or both. And the main difference uh, in the two cohorts, um, as you would expect, is that um, in the uh, earlier cohort, uh, the majority of patients, around 87%, um, underwent a stem cell transplant. Uh, whereas in the more recent cohort, um, only uh, 60, uh, only 16 percent of patients were were transplanted. And so, looking at the uh, the outcomes, uh, comparing the outcomes between the two cohorts so far, um, we are seeing a nice uh, trend towards um, improved uh, relapse-free um, and overall survival um, in the uh, more recent uh, cohort of treated patients. And then looking at um, patterns of treatment failure between the two cohorts. Um, so first looking at the uh, earlier uh, 2014 to 2020 cohort, um, we see that uh, for the patients who underwent stem cell transplant, there's actually a fairly high rate of relapse um, at around 30% um, and a, uh, a, a non, a not trivial rate of uh, death and complete remission at around 15%. Um, the number of patients who did not undergo uh, stem cell transplant in the earlier cohort uh, was small, um, but uh, the majority of those patients did uh, ultimately relapse. Um, whereas in the uh, more recent cohort, um, fortunately, um, we have not seen uh, any relapses or deaths um, so far. So to summarize, um, compared to the uh, previous approach of offering uh, stem cell transplant to all patients after the satinib-based induction, um, we're seeing a trend towards improved outcomes uh, with our current approach of anatinib-based consolidation and reserving stem cell transplant um, only for patients who do not achieve a complete molecular remission. Um, patients achieving a CMR with panatinib-based consolidation uh, may be able to safely avoid a stem cell transplant, although uh, longer follow-up is needed to determine if these uh, remissions remain durable. And importantly, um, panatinib has been uh, very well tolerated with uh, no uh, discontinuations due to toxicity uh, having been um, observed uh, thus far. And then I wanted to uh, finish up uh, by also talking about um, some of our current approaches and outcomes in um, Philadelphia from some negative ALL uh, for patients uh, 40 years of age and older. So just by way of background, um, 
AYA or uh, adolescent uh, young adult generally considered up to uh, 39 years of age. Um, and in this, uh, in this patient population, uh, pediatric style chemotherapy regimens um, have produced across several studies, uh, long-term survival between 60 and 70%, um, which is uh, superior to um, outcomes that have been achieved with uh, historically used regimens. Um, we've learned from uh, European studies that um, with uh, pediatric style chemotherapy regimens, um, favorable outcomes can be achieved um, all the way up to around uh, 55 uh, patients, 55 uh, years of age. Um, however, um, for older patients uh, around 55 to 60 years of age and above, um, pediatric style chemotherapy um, and also um, intensive um, adult type chemotherapy regimens like hypercevad um, are both associated with uh, poor long-term outcomes, uh, mainly due to uh, excessive toxicity. So um, our, our previous approach um, at our, in our group um, had been for uh, patients uh, younger than 40 years of age uh, to receive uh, pediatric inspired chemotherapy um, and patients older than 40 to receive the hyper-CVAD regimen. Uh, but based on the, the information I just uh, showed in the previous slide, um, we recently changed our approach um, so that um, now patients up to around age 55 um, can receive the uh, pediatric inspired chemotherapy regimen, um, whereas patients um, 55 years of age and older uh, receive a, uh, instead of the more intensive hyper CVAD regimen, uh, receive more of a moderate intensity chemotherapy regimen. Um, that is based on uh, several uh, published uh, European protocols. So um, looking at uh, comparing um, these uh, two uh, cohorts of patients, um, we see in the, in the previous cohort from 2014 to 2020, um, pretty much all the patients receive hyper CVAD regimen, uh, whereas in the more recent cohort, uh, around a third of patients received the pediatric inspired regimen, and roughly two thirds received uh, the moderate intensity regimen. In the more uh, recent cohort, um, there was uh, one uh, incidence of uh, mortality during induction, um, and there were two uh, instances of uh, refractory disease after induction um, compared to the previous cohort. Um, or there was uh, a, a none of, of, of either observed. Um, and uh, comparing um, the rate of allogeneic stem cell transplant and first complete remission, um, we see that um, this was uh, roughly uh, equivalent between the two cohorts um, with slightly more patients um, in the earlier hyper CVAD cohort um, having uh, undergone uh, transplantation. So, and you know, looking at uh, outcomes between the two cohorts, um, we see that um, even though there was a, a slightly higher incidence of induction mortality and refractory <coughs> disease um, in the more recent cohort, um, we are seeing a nice uh, trend towards uh, better uh, relapse-free survival in the more recent cohort, um, as well uh, as possibly um, overall survival as well. And then again, um, looking at the uh, patterns of failure between the two cohorts, um, we see that in the uh, 2014 to 2020 cohort, um, uh, the, uh, which was the hyper CVED cohort, um, we see that for patients who underwent stem cell transplant, um, outcomes were actually almost uniformly poor um, with around 50% of patients uh, having relapse um, and 33% uh, of patients having uh, died in remission, um, and amongst patients who did not undergo stem cell transplant, um, roughly uh, two-thirds of those patients uh, ultimately relapsed. Um, in the more recent cohort, um, as I mentioned, um, there was one patient who did um, die uh, during induction. Um, of the uh, two patients who failed to achieve remission 
Um, one patient uh, subsequently achieved remission with uh, salvage chemotherapy and proceeded to an uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant um, and uh, uh, currently remains in remission. Um, the other patient uh, went on to have uh, refractory disease after several uh, chemotherapy regimens, uh, ultimately went on to receive uh, CAR T cells um, and did uh, achieve a remission, um, but unfortunately um, died due to uh, infectious complications. So to summarize here, um, amongst uh, patients uh, 40 years of age and older with pH negative ALL, uh, we're seeing a trend towards better outcomes with uh, pediatric inspired and moderate intensity chemotherapy regimens uh, with a discriminatory age of around 55 uh, to decide between the two um, versus the uh, more intensive hyper CVAD regimen. Um, however, uh, we do need to determine if this difference in outcomes uh, persists with uh, longer follow-up. Um, and potential uh, explanations uh, for the difference in outcomes um, include uh, number one, uh, for the patients uh, 55 years of age and younger, um, possibly just superior efficacy of pediatric inspired chemotherapy um, versus hyper um, Number two, uh, for the patients older than 55, uh, possibly a better tolerability of the moderate intensity chemotherapy regimen uh, perhaps led to better adherence um, versus the hyper CVAD regimen. Um, and number three, um, something that I'd like to look at a little bit closer um, is the, uh, the use of uh, NGS-based um, MRD monitoring in the more, uh, in the more recent cohort, um, which perhaps uh, may have led to uh, more optimal selection of patients um, who are more appropriate for chemotherapy alone uh, versus uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant or other uh, novel immunotherapies. Um, and then for patients who uh, did undergo transplant in the more recent cohort, uh, perhaps uh, the ability to target uh, lower levels of MRD uh, perhaps uh, led to deeper remissions uh, going into transplant um, and perhaps um, uh, better, better outcomes. Um, so with that, I just uh, wanted to thank um, all of uh, my uh, senior mentors and colleagues uh, in, in the hematology division here, um, as well as uh, mentors from other institutions. Um, thank you, course, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, Do we have any questions? <laughs> and I think my volume was down. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Are there any questions out there? Mark, those differences seem quite dramatic, particularly for cancer. You don't even see that. Is it surprising to you? Or, I mean, you think it's, I mean, those are just huge differences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we, uh, you know, we do definitely need more, more follow-up time to see if those differences persist. Um, but, um, you know, I think, um, does anyone else have longer data? That yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, for the you know the combinations of uh, so the use of tenatinib. So I think for the you know the pH positive ALR piece, um, I think the the use of tenatinib uh, combined with with lenitumumab, uh, I think you know really um, uh, was was really the factor probably that that has led to better outcomes in our more recent cohort. Um, and there is um, there is a, a more uh, there's a study uh, ongoing with more mature data um, showing actually that that patients treated with just that combination, tenatinib and valenitumumab, actually almost uniformly have excellent long-term outcomes um, with, uh, with just that combination and no, uh, no stem cell transplant. Um, so, it, you know, it really, it, it's, um, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of amazing how, how far we've come um, you know, especially in, in, in pH positive ALL, uh, where previously it was thought that um, really, um, unless you undergone a stem cell transplant, um, your outcome was predicted to be very poor. Um, and now we have um, almost chemotherapy free regimens um, with patients, um, you know, achieving very excellent long term outcomes. Um, so I, I think we're, 
you know, I, I think we're, we're, we've come a long way in treating this disease and, and we're, and we're coming out, we're continuing to come a long way. So um, it's nice to, you know, it's nice to see that our, our patients are uh, doing well also. Any additional questions out there? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>